All right, good, e good evening, everyone. I'm Jonathan Galassi, and I'm here with Jamaica Kincaid, Kaz Phillips, and Robert Antoni, and we're talking about Derek's legacy. And I think you've heard his legacy uh, just now in the young, in the voices of the young writers who love him and who are influenced by him. And here, I'm, I'm here with three writers whom he loved and whom he promoted, believed in, and they're gonna talk about his legacy because they are his legacy in many ways. I'd just like to say that for me, as his publisher and as someone who came along after he had already triumphed, the thing about Kaz's incredible piece is about, it's, you know, we had love after love, but this was Derek before Derek in a way. Uh, uh, I was waiting for part two, which was the triumph, <laughs> but we'll hear about that. But for me, the great, the utter greatness of Derek resided in his sound, in what he could say and how he said it. I am not home until I hear Cezanne sing. That's one of his greatest lines, I think. And I think my own take on how he triumphed in America had to do with the power of his writing. Joseph Brodsky said, he is the one by whom the language lives. He didn't say that just about Derek, but he said that about poets who he deemed uh, carriers of the language. And I think Robert Lowell, who was the dominant poet of that era, recognized Derek's greatness and was one of the people who helped him uh, find the right venues for uh, his, his incredible uh, expressive gift. But I'd like to begin by asking Jamaica how you got to know Derek and how, what your relationship with him was. Oh, um, well, you were, um, you are our publisher, Roger. Uh, I got to know Derek because Roger and uh, Dorothea took me to a reading of his. Um, and um, I was a young writer at the New Yorker. Uh, I didn't know anything about, um, and I knew a little bit about him and uh, uh, some other West Indian writers, but I didn't under uh, understand uh, the, f the power um, of him. And uh, it, it was a, a little bit intimidating, but he was so kind uh, um, to me. And um, the, uh, uh, he he saw he tried I think I can say not qualified to uh, make me conscious of things that I should I should be I was very resistant to advice um, when I was young so but um, so as he a, as opposed to now. Uh, <laughs> 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 well. Um, so, so he would tell me I should read this. Oh, he said, you did, have you read this? Have you read that? And of course I, I hadn't. I, I only read what I liked. And uh, so he sent, he sent me a book of um, write, writers from the Caribbean that I had never heard of. And they were all men. And uh, I didn't know what to make of it. I thought, well... Um, yeah, uh, the road is, um, I didn't, uh, well, I didn't think the road was any harder than it had been before, but I realized that um, they were all men. In any case, uh, he w always um, made room for me, though I was very uh, sort of shy about, um, oh, I could tell you one incredible story that I don't think... Uh, um, I, I, for some reason, he and Joseph invited me to some, took, I shouldn't say invited me, took me along to something they were doing in Gartenberg. 
And um, so this is maybe even before we, we knew each other. And um, uh, so I was in a, a hotel all by, I, I'll never forget the whole thing, the two of them together, they were like these brothers, but um, something thicker than blood. And uh, um, so anyway, I went to my, my room and I turned on the television, and since I suppose it's Sweden, it had the most amazing pornography I'd yeah. ever seen. It was really incredible, and I thought, wow, this is great. So the next... <laughs> <laughs> so the next time I saw him, um, I said, oh, Derek, you'll never guess this is incredible on um, television. Um, this incredible pornography, and he said, stop, I don't want to hear that out of your mouth. <laughs> and that began uh, uh, a line of a formal uh, and loving relationship, but I knew that there were, when I was with him, there were things that, um, if I were to say them to him, uh, there are certain things I couldn't say to him, and there are certain things when I said them, they had to be, uh, in a certain form, and in many ways, when I was writing, I'm writing, uh, I think of him, um, and I'll come back to why. Bobby, how did you get to know Derek? Um, my connection to Derek was always Trinidad. It was just, um, Derek, I think, spent more years in Trinidad than St. Lucia, probably. He was He was, he's a, an, an adopted Trini, but he, um, I think he gave us the landscape of Trinidad, both in the, the, the island itself and its people better than any other writer, including the, the VS guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> You mean Mr. Nightfall? Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Nightfall. Um, but I, I just want, wanted to, to um, express a feeling that I've had at these seminars with, with just about every artist who has has spoken. Um, I, the, the word cosmopolitan was used uh, this morning, but I think of the word global. Um, for me, Derek gave to all of us, to everyone who has spoken on this stage for the, for the past two days, the ability to be global and at the same time profoundly, complicatedly Caribbean. Um, Kaz, what would you say? Um, I met Derek 30 years ago in London when he had a play being produced and um, I'd actually just reviewed the Arkansas Testament um, which was published in 87 for the Los Angeles Times. So he was on my mind, he, you know, um, it's on my mind because he should be on every writer's mind, but he was on my mind because I'd just read his latest volume. He was in London, I was living in London at the time, and uh, the producer of the play of Derek's was a friend of mine, and she arranged for us to have lunch. And of course, I was extremely excited to have lunch with Derek Walcott, um, and I, yeah, I learned two things about Derek immediately at the lunch. I learned that he was, and he remained across the 30 years, the most disciplined man I know, I ever knew, um, fiercely disciplined in his work habits, and that's a very important thing for a writer, particularly a young writer, to learn. Um, he told me he'd been up since five o'clock writing, and Actually, um, that was pretty much his habit. I mean, he got up very, very early to work, and he had a religious ferocity about his routine. Um, 
The other thing I learned was he's one of the world's great complainers. Yeah. Uh, and, and he was tremendously consistent um, throughout his life um, about complaining about restaurants in particular. Uh, and I, I suggested we went to an Indian restaurant for lunch. And I remember the look on his face as he looked at me and said, Indian for lunch? Uh, and then he did something which all of us know uh, on this, all of us know very well that uh, he did all of his life. He asked them to turn the music down. <laughs> I, I, I agree with him on that. <laughs> um, so uh, it was, you know, if you're a writer, uh, there are certain things you learn from reading, very important things you learn from reading. But if you're fortunate, there are also certain things that you learn from an encounter with a writer. Not every writer by any means, but some writers allow you to believe that certain things are possible. And if you're very lucky, some writers believe in you. You know, I've, I've always felt that Derek exemplified uh, an aspect of Caribbean writing that uh, is, is different from the American style in the sense that there's a direct connection back to the rhetoric of English poetry that we in America have somehow let go of or, or lost in a way. Lowell was probably the last poet who, who, who had the um, balls or the guts or the <laughs> temerity to use uh, rhetoric that way. But Derek was very powerful and natural in his reaching back to the great tradition of English poetry. And I, I think that that is, um, you know, one of his incredible achievements. And I, I, I wonder how that is playing out in Caribbean, in the Caribbean today. And I've always felt actually that Derek was underrated in America yes. as a writer. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's... That's what do you, true. What do you I, all think about that? I, I've often heard a lot of American poets um, not l say they didn't uh, like him and Joseph. They, they, I think they both were equally under um, appreciated. But I, I, I think, let me see if I can say this um, clearly about the Americans. Um, uh, Americans, I think, uh, uh, lose tradition deliberately. They are always, um, I think, I think, always uh, deliberately trying to uh, not be connected to the uh, to the past. Um, uh, but um, <clears throat> in the uh, tradition that, and, and I probably might have been the last generation to um, be attached to it or to be instructed in it, the English, uh, the English canon. Um, and Derek did something that no one else, I think, had done before. Instead of uh, mimicking it or um, uh, embalming himself in it, he used it as a kind of uh, machine or, well, maybe mm -hmm. that's too, um, not quite the right image, but he, it was just, one of the ingredients of something new that uh, he was making. I, uh, the new thing uh, to me that he was doing, and I'm so grateful for it because it, it was an enormous relief for me in thinking about the world I was writing in, he made a claim for the landscape of the West Indies, the Caribbean, that no one else had done uh, before, the sea was no longer um, a, 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 a place of death and uh, the end. The sky was no longer just this beautiful trap in which the sun 
uh, um, trapped us even more. Everything uh, about us that had been, uh, we had felt sort of degraded uh, by, he just transformed it and made it into something that all the world came from. And I think that that was extraordinarily uh, new and I, I don't, I, it's amazing to me that he survived doing it because when you, you don't understand, um, the, the, the two things would be something really old fashioned, everyone trying to sound like Wordsworth or something, um, uh, uh, Wordsworth through the mouth of Horatio Nelson, something like that. And, um, or the alternative was um, Naipaul's hatred and self-hatred. Uh, but then you had this celebration of where we come from, that even the despair and the pain was turned out to have been a tremendous strength. Um, not to t take up too much, but... Yeah, no, um... It's it uh, the the other the other um, gift I feel that that Derek gave to to Caribbean writers was you know this fusion of of two languages. He talked about the 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 language of the mind, which is English, and the the language of the body and of action, which he called called dialect. And he talked about how they were separate things, but in the in the poetry he manages to merge these two seamlessly. And this was a one of the most important lessons I think that we as Caribbean writers had to learn how to bring those two, those two languages together. I remember the first time I went to St. Lucia, I would go through all these towns that were, I knew them as places in his poetry, I knew them as names and they were real and the incredible um, excitement of, that the place had been mythologized and immortalized. Or, uh, and I think, uh, Rowan wrote, wrote that poem to Obama about how the the furrow of the the um, of the the field. the field is like the page in which the, there's always an equivalency between the between the writer's creation and and nature or or life. I mean, the last line of Omeros is when he left the beach, the sea was still going on, which is su such a funny line. You know, the sea is still talking. It's, still, hmm. it's continuing, but it's also just babbling on, you know. Kaz? What you? I was just, you know, it's not, it's not even 12 months since we lost Derek. Um, and I really can't think, I mean, the size of the achievement, lots of people have read written about it, lots of people have talked about it, but I can't really think of any other literary tradition which would be so um, denuded if you took one writer out of it. The Anglophone Caribbean tradition without Derek Walcott would be an entirely different landscape. Um, it's, uh, it's an amazing job of heavy lifting that was done in, as an act of generosity, not just towards the region, not just towards St. Lucia, but Derek was a teacher. He believed in passing on the tradition. So all the writers who preceded us on the stage and spoke understand that. Um, and many writers who are not here understand that. The, what informed his life on the page and off the, off the page was generosity. His mother was a teacher, Derek was a teacher. He understood what it meant. Um, not to pull the ladder up after you. But he was always telling you guys what to do and what not to do. Yeah. You know, he, he was, but um, you've forgotten, Jonathan, that's what teachers do. <laughs> <laughs> well, some do it in an inductive way and some do it in a... 
Derek yeah. is old school. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but he offered himself to us as a role model and as a mentor in the most generous mm. way. And this is what we need so badly in the Caribbean, um, a literature that's, that's, we all know what Caribbean literature is, but when, when Derek started out, there was not that literature. He and a handful of others made it, but the, the, I think of myself as the second generation. There's at least a third coming along, and he has given himself to, to, to all of us in, in, um, in the way of a, a mentor and a, and a role model um, that, you know, the, uh, no, no other Caribbean artist has done. Um, well, I think, to me, what was so moving about Kaz's talk was you know, all artists start from nothing and they find their way and so, but Kaz left us on the doorstep of the incredible flowering that was Derek's career. And uh, he, he talked about his work in theater, but you know, he was, he was writing poetry at the same time and it was really his poetry that eventually brought him where he ended up. Um, and not only that, he was also a wonderful painter. He was, he was a polymath. He was uh, a genius uh, uh, of a type that ver we see, very seldom see. But he, it was really his poetry, I think, that made him world-renowned. Well, he was a poet before he was a playwright because he he published, as, as you well know, in 1949, he published... Um, self-published. Self-published, mm. 25 poems, I think the title of the volume was. He was 19 years old. And um, discipline, he sold them himself. He believed in himself. Um, and I think his quest and desire, his principal desire was to be a poet. Um, theater, he loved the theater, but the theater requires um, collaboration, the theater requires a building, the theater requires um, teamwork. It's not a solitary occupation, it requires uh, a certain amount of communication and a certain amount of accommodation of other people's temperaments and other people's ideas. And, and a tremendous amount of energy as well. And Derek, Derek oscillated between the solitary life of a poet and the communal life as a theater practitioner, I think as well as anybody could manage that oscillation. Um, but fundamentally, um, Derek is a poet. And as we know, his theater work is imbued with poetry. Absolutely. He wrote verse it's, drama. It's poetic drama, yeah. yeah. I mean, his it all goes back to his mother, doesn't it, really? She read yeah. him Wordsworth. She, she, she was the source, I think, of his. Mm. Well, she recited Shakespeare to him yes. as a child, and he learned, I mean, one of his teaching um, habits, which often confounded his students, his American students, was his determination to make students learn to recite verse by heart. Um, and of course, as you know, the editor of the volume here, Glenn Maxwell, was one of his students and often talks about how strange and in some senses old-fashioned it seemed to be in a creative writing class in an American university uh, without chit-chat about agents and publication <laughs> and being famous and what to do with your first advance. Derek would have none of that. Uh, Derek made them read work and learn it by heart and recite it. Um, and that's why I say he was old school, but he was also right. 
<laughs> Jamaica, what do you think Derek's legacy well, is going to be? Uh, um, uh, you, you talked about reciting uh, his mother reading Wordsworth or he, or he reciting it. I think that was part of, of the way um, we were educated. We had a lot of, uh, you, you, yeah, we had to learn a lot of, of uh, poems. And in fact, uh, and I told this to Derek and he, he was appalled until I came to the end of the story because he couldn't be, I, I was telling him something. <laughs> Um, but we had to memorize uh, in a lot of things that were uh, utterly relevant to, to um, not just our lives, but what would we what would we do with so many things and uh, uh, that we were that were we were told were, we were being made to feel would become a part of our existence. And so I was telling him that when I uh, was about. 10 years or so that I swore I would forget I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, um, which is a poem, uh, it's an ode to daffodils, is sometimes how, how it's called. And um, I somehow got the idea that uh, why should I remember a poem about a flower at the time had no hope of seeing? Daffodils are not a, a tropical flower. Mm. And uh, so uh, I, uh, this actually happened. So uh, much I, I've written about it, but much later in, in my adult life, I proceeded over years to plant 10,000 daffodils on my lawn. And, um, and when I do, I um, recite Wordsworth and drink cheap champagne. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with friends. And the reason I, I did it is because at some point in my adult life, I said, but wait a minute, it's not Wordsworth's fault. It's not Wordsworth's fault that I had to memorize his poem. The ends to which it was put is the fault. And so I, I said to him, uh, to Derek, you know, so I've redeemed uh, the daffodils. But before I got to that part, he was going to interrupt me to tell me how uh, uh, wrong I was, and, but to um, to tell you what I mean in in that anecdote about uh, uh, Derek, all the things that we were given to us or were directed at us, which were really in many ways meant to diminish, he took them and claimed them and transformed them. None of uh, us would read, um, a lot of us, I should say, wouldn't read Wordsworth or Hardy without Derek. You can hear the echo of uh, the world in him, and it's because he took it and transformed it. He was not afraid of it. Well, that's, I mean, in a way, Omeros yes. exemplifies that. Yes. It's, 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 it establishes an equivalency between Caribbean and the uh, ancient and Greek, Greek world, yes. and it's uh, one. Of, it's a brilliant conjunction that's totally natural. Once it's once it's happened, it's of course. And uh, uh, but I don't know if um, he's ho he's Homeric in that sense. He is. He is. I actually have said he's our Homer. I I think of him um, as the person who tells us told us who we are. I mean, I, I remember when I started to read him, I thought, oh, I don't have to figure out how to explain the sea. It exists. The world that I'm going to write about, that I'm writing about, it's there. And uh, so I didn't have to invent it. It was already a platform. What's that line of his, never get tired of this? Was about, something about the ocean, about the, oh, the rhythm. Oh, uh, a lap, lap. And of course, the rhythm of the iambic rhythm and the, the rep, repetition of the sea sound are so intertwined in him. And everything is about creation, uh, yeah. about art, really. Yeah. Oh. Oh, and I noticed that, um, I noticed it before, but uh, there is something about, well, the way his poems are, they, they don't, 
even when they question, the question is an answer. But, uh, um, and by that I mean, uh, he simply says what there is, as if, um, you know, in the beginning there was the sea, and the sea was mine. And um, he, he uh, has that way of just writing each sentence with this uh, possession of it before it's on the page, as if he's already um, possessed it and is perhaps sharing it. Bob, when did you last see Derek? Oof. <laughs> um, I think about three days before he, he, um, he passed away um, in the hospital and we spent several several days in in St. Lucia um, and went every day to to see him and he was mostly non-responsive but there was one moment when he did um, open his eyes and and look at at Ali and me and there was a moment of, of recognition um, Derek was also a fantastic critic and uh, uh, a very poetic but very decisive and um, wonderful one. Another great string to his bow. Um, well, thank you so much for listening. Yeah. And now there is a dinner at the Little White House, which is on Truman Annex. And the easiest way to walk there, because you can't park there, is to, when you exit the San Carlos, to turn left and walk three streets and make a left on Caroline Street. And you walk right into the gate of Truman Annex, where someone will direct you to the little White House. So left when you leave, three streets, turn left on Caroline Street. <laughs>